greatest policy failure of our current generation in Australian politics is climate change. Climate change policy uh, captures the ultimate uh, zeitgeist of the modern Australian political era. No other policy issue has been plagued by such partisan attacks. And no other policy issue has heralded the repeated fall of Australian Prime Ministers, despite the heroic efforts of former Prime Minister Turnbull and Minister Frydenberg when he was the Environment Minister. The government has reincarnated their unshakable Groundhog Day commitment to maintaining a policy vacuum. Extreme elements from both sides of the political spectrum have frustrated moderate centrist climate change policies, policies which not only find their greatest foundation in science but also have the most chance of achieving lasting bipartisan consensus. The failure of the political class has become Australia's failure. It is the people of Australia and the generations that follow that will bear the burden of this inaction. And I must stress this is not a left-wing, right-wing issue. The scientific evidence for climate change is compelling and it's what is lacking is action. It is for this reason and from today I am seeking to launch the Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action with my co-chair to be the member for Wentworth. Together we will use the group to foster progress on climate change policy and action. It's action that we are failing here in the parliament. The most sceptical and cynical Australians should think of action on climate change as an insurance policy, insurance against inconvenient truths, predictions of disaster and everything in between. And my goodness, if Rupert Murdoch says um, that we should give the climate the benefit of the doubt, surely you'd think most in government would listen. Thousands of experts act as reviewers, ensuring uh, the reports of the IPCC reflect the full range of views of the scientific community, and yet that report has fallen on deaf ears in the parliament. Warming caused by human activity will persist for centuries to millennia and will continue to cause further long-term changes to the climate system, including sea level rise. To put it in, in perspective, we are in trouble. Rainfall patterns in Australia are shifting and the severity of floods and droughts has increased. The area roughly between Adelaide and Brisbane has already experienced a 15 per cent decline in late autumn and early winter rainfall over the past few decades. And across the Murray-Darling Basin, stream flows have declined by 41 per cent since the mid-1990s. Warmer atmospheres can hold more water vapour, increasing the risk of flash flooding. A hotter climate dries out vegetation, and creating a tinderbox for bushfires, and we are seeing this the world over. My own electorate is already feeling the effects of more volatile rainfall with flash flooding and being a regular occurrence. Our communities on the lower lakes know only too well the devastation caused by drought. However, the lack of large-scale government support for long-term environmental rehabilitation and future-proofing means we are doomed to see the same story of agricultural and environmental distress repeat itself yet again. My coastal communities are increasingly concerned and affected by king tides, severe storms, coastal erosion and sea level rise. My coastal councils are desperate for assistance because there is a problem that local government simply doesn't have the financial capacity or expertise to address. I and the Australian Coastal Councils Association have repeatedly called for the federal government to take leadership on this country-wide issue. 85 per cent of Australians live on the coast, but the federal government refuses to step up and plan for their future. It's almost as if we are in a climate change denial parliament. The call for action is clear. Bipartisan consensus for scientific-based policy in the sensible centre is critical to this. We, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and that's why it is just astonishing that the government itself threw out a Prime Minister based on the NEG, which was a relatively um, benign uh, policy with respect to energy. I, it, it's just astounding that you do this to yourselves and you do it to the nation. If Australia is to carry its share of the global burden to face down the challenges of climate change, we need bipartisan consensus. We need action from this government today and I call on all members listening to this speech and indeed in this chamber and other chambers please join uh, the parliamentary friends for climate action uh, because if the government's not going to do it it will have to be another thing that the parliament will have to address alone. Thank you. I thank the member for Mayo. Is there a seconder for the motion? Uh, I'll second for the motion. Speaker and reserve my right to speak.
I thank the member for Corwell. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Hughes. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to speak on the member for Mayo's motion this afternoon. And the member notes in her motion that uh, paragraph 1A that the scientific evidence for the existent climate change is in. There's no longer should be in doubt. And to make no ambiguities, Deputy Speaker, I agree with that. The science is in, the climate is changing. We only have to look at a recent paper published in January 2014 in the journal Nature that said Australian tropical cyclone activity is lower than at any time in the past 550 years. We only have to go to the Australian Bureau of Meteoro Meteorology, uh, their numbers, and we see, Deputy Speaker, a declining trend in cyclones in this nation. In fact, for the season 2015-16, there was not a single severe cyclone striking Australia. Not one. And yet we compare that, Deputy Speaker, back to the season 1984-85, uh, when we had no less than 11 severe cyclones. And yet, the other season, Deputy Speaker, not a single one. So yes, the climate is changing. There are less cyclones affecting Australia. We see the same in tornadoes in the USA. Significant downward trend, Deputy Speaker. This year, likely the lowest amount of tornadoes in history. So yes, the climate is changing. We look at the information on snowfall, Deputy Speaker. Winter snowfall in the Northern Hemisphere is actually the trend is increasing. So we are getting more snowfall in winter in the Northern Hemisphere. The climate is changing. Deputy Speaker, we are a land of drought and flooding range. The current drought is terrible, as I'm sure that you among all members in this place know. But thankfully, Deputy Speaker, if you look at the rainfall records, the drought, Deputy Speaker, was far, in many places in this country, far worse back over 100 years ago. So yes, we are seeing all those climatic changes. But Deputy Speaker, we hear also in this motion that the government should take serious action on climate change. Well, Deputy Speaker, I say that the greatest moral challenge that we face as members of parliament is to admit that nothing that we do in Australia will actually change the climate. This is what not only the science says, but what the chief scientist says. And I quote, this was from a questioning by Senator Ian MacDonald. And the senator said to the uh, chief scientist, in Australia we admit less than 1.3 per cent of the world's carbon emissions. The chief scientist. About that, Senator Macdonald, if we were to reduce the world's carbon emissions by 1.3 per cent, what impact would that make on changing the climate of the world? So in other words, if we reduced our CO2 emissions and CO2 emissions equivalent to zero, what effect would that have on the temperature? The chief scientist, his answer, virtually nothing. So the fact is, Deputy Speaker, Whatever we do here in policy will have no effect on the climate. Now, you may well argue, well, what about if all nations to work together like that at the Paris Agreement? Well, Deputy Speaker, if you do the numbers and if we assume that every single nation meets its Paris commitments by 2030 and we assume that the computer modelling is correct, how much warming do we avoid? One twentieth of one degree by the year 2100. That is what is achieved under the Paris Commitment, one twentieth of one degree. The greatest moral challenge that we have is to make those admissions to the Australian public and not virtue seek on this issue. Of course, Deputy Speaker, others have brought up the issue of Tuvalu and have said Tuvalu is in eminent risk of disappearance. But actually, Deputy Speaker, if you look at the peer-reviewed science, what the peer-reviewed science says about Tuvalu, Auckland University, Professor Kench, has found, Deputy Speaker, that since the 1970s, Tuvalu has actually increased in size. Increased in size, 2.9 per cent. And the professor says, the study findings may seem counterintuitive, but the dominant mode of change over time on Tuvalu has been expansion, not erosion. That is the peer-reviewed science. Now, when we talk about taking action on climate change, Deputy Speaker, it's very important to remember that our electricity sector, which we all talk about with our solar panels, our wind turbines, is only one third of our CO2 emissions. 
I ask other members of parliament, please tell me what you are going to do in the spaces of agriculture. What are you doing in road transport? What are you doing in commercial aviation? What are you doing in the mining sector to reduce our emissions? The fact is, no matter whatever we do, the reality is that expired. we will not make change the climate here with those policies. I thank the right. member for Hughes. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Newcastle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for Mayo for uh, bringing this motion before the House. Um, and uh, I saw her briefly outside uh, to give her that uh, thanks personally because she had to get to another chamber. But I am very pleased to speak on the need for urgent action on climate change. It is an issue of the highest order. Climate change isn't a speculative theory anymore. It's a devastating reality that has very real, measurable impacts uh, across the globe. Indeed, the five warmest years on global uh, record have occurred in the past seven years. But the brutal ignorance, or perhaps rank deceit, displayed by some members of the government about this fundamental scientific reality is one of the greatest travesties of politics today. The list of climate crimes of the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison Liberal governments is long and shameful. Over the past five years, they've systematically set out to dismantle or shackle everything Australia had to reduce emissions and stem the dire impacts of climate change. They abolished the carbon pricing mechanism. They removed the cap on pollution and installed the dodgy direct action program which paid polluters in the hope they'd somehow stop polluting. They defunded Climate Council. They launched a savage war on the renewable industry which saw investments plummet by as much as 90%. They tried to axe the renewable energy target. They tried to shut down the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA, which had its funding cut anyway. And then they set up a pathetically low climate target that all but guarantees we cannot meet our Paris targets and obligations. And all of this in the direction of, um, sorry, all of this under the direction of the apparent real leaders of the government, and that is a very rabid but small right wing fringe dwellers in the party room who have completely hijacked the Liberal and National parties in Australia. Shame on you. And it's just been an ongoing disappointment for Australians everywhere that both those party rooms seem unable to deal with this small minority rump that has hijacked climate change and effective policy responses in this nation for years and years. Of course, this gross neglect of climate and energy policies not, uh, has not even seen spiralling electricity uh, prices and plummeting businesses. Uh, we've seen the plummeting business confidence and investment. It's also having a direct and material impact on emissions. Under the former Labor government, carbon emissions dropped more than 10 per cent, but since the Liberals got into power, they've risen year on year. The government's own data shows that under its policy void, carbon pollution will keep rising all the way out to 2030, the further estate of projections. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change starkly outlined the very real chance we'll exceed 1.5 degrees temperature by 2040. We use a lot of superlatives in this place, but there are no words strong enough to impress the grave threat that this would pose to our health our food security, our water supply and indeed our very existence. The time for climate denialism in our federal government is over. The time to end the war on renewables is here and the time for real action on climate change is now. And it's not just Labor saying this. The roar of community dissent is becoming deafening. Australians want action on climate change and they want it now. Last week in my election, I met with around 30 young people between ages 5 and 13 from the Newcastle East Public School. They said that they're concerned about the impact of climate change on our animals, our plants and our oceans. And they entreated me to take their message to Parliament. 
It is a sad state of affairs when primary school students are more informed than government members about the dire implications of climate change, but that is the sad reality. My message to those students and to those young people across Australia was simple. Labor will not shirk our responsibility to future generations. We've committed to carb reducing carbon pollution in line with the 40 5 per cent emissions target by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. Labor will not having shirk expired, our I response. thank the member. And the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call a member for Grangler. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to support this motion. And I congratulate the member for Mayo on the comprehensive nature of the proposition that she's put forward before the parliament this evening. It is common sense. We know that. The precautionary principle means that we need to act on climate change, and the sooner we act, the cheaper that action will be and the more benefit we will gain from that action. I've been here a while, Mr Deputy Speaker, and for a while I was the environment and climate change spokesperson uh, for the party. Uh, who I uh, wrote uh, the policy with uh, Kim Beasley, the climate change blueprint, back in 2006. And we campaigned for that blueprint that included, of course, an emissions trading scheme, a price on carbon. It included the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. It included measures to improve sustainability in housing and in transport. Uh, it included the policy of supporting the renewable energy target being lifted to 20 per cent by 2020. At the time we adopted that policy, the target was just two. So it was a tenfold increase, an expression of faith that we had in human ingenuity to develop technology that would make a real difference in terms of reducing our emissions and improving our productivity and creating jobs at the same time. And indeed, it is important to remember that in 2007, uh, John Howard changed his mind in the lead up to that election. And there was a bipartisan position for, for supporting an emissions trading scheme in the lead up uh, to that election. But unfortunately, uh, the coalition changed its mind when we had the carbon pollution reduction scheme in 2009. It still would have been carried had the Greens political party in the Senate voted for that proposition. And uh, if that had happened, I'm convinced that there would be a price on carbon still in place today that would have been doing its job and would have made that transition to a clean energy future uh, so much easier. The problem that we had uh, wasn't just that the climate change sceptics uh, got control uh, of the coalition uh, under the uh, former uh, Prime Minister and the member for Warringah. It's that they also became market sceptics as well and opposed any market-based mechanisms to promote change. Uh, since the change of government, of course, we've seen uh, the action on climate change go backwards. We've seen uh, a government that has been unable to come up with a comprehensive energy plan. They had the emissions intensity scheme, then they asked the chief scientist to produce a policy, and he came up with the clean energy target, which they abandoned. And then we had various versions of the national energy guarantee, uh, which after going through the party room, not once, but twice, they then abandoned their own policy. And uh, the fact is uh, that now uh, this, this uh, government doesn't have an energy policy going forward. The fact is that the private sector and the energy sector uh, are saying that what they want is certainty. They need policy certainty so as to promote that investment, uh, but they're not getting it from this government. Well, they will have it from Labor. We'll put on the table uh, our proposal to be prepared to support the NEG and negotiate with the government. We've put on the table our commitment of 45 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030. 
net zero emissions by 2050, 50% 50 renewable energy by 2030. The fact is that we are the party of the future in terms of the government, and we're prepared to work with people of goodwill, such as the member for Mayo, I note the newly elected member for Wentworth in this chamber this evening, people of goodwill who understand that climate change shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be something that the whole parliament unites uh, together in order to achieve change, and we're prepared to work cooperatively with members of the coalition of goodwill as well, because this is an issue that should be beyond politics. It's an issue about our Graeber. future. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate the member for Mayo for uh, putting on this very important topic. Uh, and I'm going to start by uh, saying that uh, one of the premises, unfortunately, of the motion uh, was unfortunate, and that's that the government's target was in some way adequate as a contribution to taking on climate change. The sad fact is the government's climate change target of a 26 per cent reduction on 2000 levels by 2030 is woefully inadequate. It does not represent Australia taking meaningful action. It does not represent Australia making a contribution commensurate with our part in the global challenge. It's wildly out of step with what comparative countries such as the United Kingdom, Germany or other countries in Europe or Canada are taking. And what's even sadder, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the government won't even meet their own inadequate targets. The government's own figures show that our 2020 emissions uh, will be the same as those in the year 2000. Let me repeat that. Our emissions in 2020 will be the same as Australia's emissions in 2000, and our 2030 emissions, based on current projections, will only be 5 per cent below 2005 levels. That is a damning indictment on this government's lack of commitment to taking action on climate change. And in fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, carbon pollution has risen in the economy for three consecutive years. Last year it rose by 1.5 per cent alone. The only reason we're, we'll be reaching and meeting the 2020 Kyoto targets is because of the visionary policies of the Beatty Bly Labor governments to take action around land clearing in Queensland and Labor's carbon price, which in two years reduced carbon pollution by 14 million tonnes alone. They are the only reasons we will meet our 2020 targets. And as I said, this government has no plan on how we'll meet 2030 targets. Their emissions reduction fund is a dog. Half of the abatement is, isn't meaningful abatement, uh, and we're seeing uh, projects having to hand back their uh, revenue. Right, They've right. had uh, six energy policies in two years, and in fact, they had four energy policies in 14 days. We had NEG 1, NEG 2, NEG 3, and then the current energy ministers uh, basically uh, abandonment of any emissions reduction policy. So this government isn't committed to taking action on climate change. I'm proud to say the Labor opposition is. We've got a commitment to reducing emissions by 45 per cent by 2030. That is based on the best evidence from the Climate Change Authority that that is the appropriate level of emissions reduction uh, for Australia, and we've got a solid plan to hit that. Uh, we released it in energy last week to uh, overwhelming stakeholder support, and we'll announce our policies in the other sectors to achieve that target. So Labor will have a genuine uh, alternative, a policy that will not only cut emissions. In the energy sector, it will cut the cost of electricity because renewable energy is the cheapest form of new energy, and it will drive up to 71,000 new jobs. Uh, but in the time remaining, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to caution people who are passionate about this area to not repeat the mistakes of the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, where we saw a group of people in the Greens political party pursue policy purity and political opportunism at the expense of taking concrete action. They put the perfect uh, ahead of the possible and they voted down the CPRS. They voted with the member for Ringer and the Luddites in the Liberal Party to vote down the CPRS. The five Green senators voted with Tony Abbott uh, to defeat the CPRS. They were the sole difference between the CPRS getting up or not. 
and that led to the nine years of climate wars we've got right now. Just think about it for a second, Mr Deputy Speaker. If the Greens have been willing to compromise and say, here's an ETS that we can build upon, here's an ETS that will be effective, here's an ETS that's supported by key stakeholders, implemented in 2009, would have demonstrated that the world, the sky, would not fall in. We wouldn't have had the ridiculous comments about Wyala being wiped out, the $100, kilo, $100 uh, roast lamb from the member for New England. We wouldn't have had any of that silliness. We would have proved to the Australian people that we can take meaningful action on climate change, and we could have scaled it up from there. Instead, they put their petty political self-interest ahead, and we're paying the price now. So I urge those same people not to grandstand again, not to talk about going for the perfect, but instead to go for something that's achievable, that is practical, that we can build upon, which is Labor's concrete action to take action on climate change. Well, I thank the member for Shortland. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Wentworth. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of the notice of motion moved by the member for Mayo calling on the government to take genuine and meaningful action to meet Australia's commitments under the Paris Agreement and take significantly greater action to reduce emissions. The scientific consensus on climate change is in. Climate change is real and we must act as a nation to do our part to help reduce its impact. In the recent Wentworth by-election, one of the major issues people in the electorate raised with me was climate change. Unfortunately, in Australia, there's been a major disconnect between the desire of a clear majority of Australians for meaningful and immediate action on climate change and the current government's ongoing inability to produce any coherent policy to address it. As a nation and as global citizens, we must embrace pathways to effectively cut greenhouse gas emissions while safeguarding national economic prosperity and affordable, reliable energy for all Australians. Implementing solutions that are effective, efficient and do not discriminate or create inequality is our real challenge in this debate. In 2002, when I was serving as AMA president, we held a summit on climate change and human health policy. There are enormous public health implications of climate change, such as heat-related deaths and illnesses, vector-borne illnesses, waterborne illnesses such as gastroenteritis, reduced food production such as reduced fish populations, and air pollution related illnesses such as asthma. The World Health Organization estimates there will be 250,000 additional deaths globally per year between 2030 and 2050 due to climate change. Those of us most vulnerable to these effects are children, the poor, the elderly, and those who are already sick. It is clear that something needs to be done. By listening and learning during the by-election campaign, the voters told me that they wanted action, and I made it a key part of my platform. During the campaign, I announced my intentions on climate policy, transition to 100 per cent renewable energy, 50 per cent by 2030, restore a credible scientific research-based climate change authority to inform government policy, oppose any federal government underwriting of new coal-fired power generation, Stop government subsidies of new fossil fuel developments, including the proposed Adani mine. Meet our commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement as, as a minimum. Ban political donations by fossil fuel companies and establish a register to force all senators and members to disclose meetings with fossil fuel companies and their lobbyists. Contrast this to the current government, which is dominated by climate skeptics. The former member for Wentworth and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull made this clear when he was speaking at the Australia Bar Association's annual conference in Sydney recently. Mr Turnbull reportedly said a climate skeptic group within his own party held the line that if you don't do what we want, we will blow the show up. And I quote, the truth is the Liberal Party and the Coalition is not capable of dealing with climate change. This is simply not good enough. When an overwhelming proportion of Australians is concerned about the effects of climate change. The latest UN intergovernmental report on climate change report shows the urgent need for global action on climate change. The report is groundbreaking in that it looks at the impacts of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees Celsius. It finds that reaching the lower target would lessen the risk of drought, floods and extreme heat. The authors of the report said urgent and unprecedented changes are needed to reach the lower target. The half degree difference could prevent corals from being completely eradicated and ease pressure on the Arctic. Solving the climate change crisis requires vision and leadership. 
the Prime Minister's thought bubble on the day the IPCC report was released of overturning the ban on building nuclear reactors in Australia was not and is not the answer. We saw how that worked out for the people of Fukushima. The people of Wentworth and Australia generally want decisive action on cutting greenhouse emissions and a well-researched and deliverable plan for a just transition from coal to renewables. Australia must eventually source all our energy requirements from renewable sources in order to limit the effects of climate change. This will require Australia coming together around an agreed plan. I will be guided by experts on the timing and pace that Australia can responsibly transition to 100 per cent renewables, but I want the experts on climate and energy to develop this plan. One of the ways to drive a reduction in emissions is to shift away from coal. Coal is old technology that will never be able to become clean. Thermal coal-fired power generation needs to be phased out in an orderly way as renewable sources become more affordable and available. Taxpayers' money should be invested in creating the long-term sustainable transition to renewable technologies, not propping up environmentally harmful fossil fuels. We have abundant natural resources to harness. Renewables, solar and wind are now a cheaper form of electricity generation than new coal-fired power plants. The current lack of policy certainty is hindering investment, Deputy Speaker. Time is running out for an effective national policy to address climate change. The longer we wait, the more expensive and difficult this transition becomes. We can and we must all assume responsibility for supporting and embracing change for our children, for our land and for our planet. I thank the member for uh, Wentworth. And I call the member. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, I rise today to commemorate Remembrance Day. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we uh, uh, just need to adjourn that debate. Um, and there being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. And now I call the clerk. Private members' business. Next order of the day, Remembrance Day, resumption of debate on the motion moved by the member for Forest. And uh, the uh, question is that the motion be agreed to and I call the member for Longman. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Will I rise today to commemorate Remembrance Day that fell on the 11th day of this, the 11th month. Every year, people all around Australia stop to reflect on the great sacrifice that was made by those who served our nation in the First World War. And this year marks the centenary of the armistice, 100 years from when the guns fell silent on the Western Front. Our country, of course, was still in its infancy then. From a population of less than 5 million, more than 400,000 Australians enlisted to serve. With just over one in 12 Australians courageously enlisting to serve, it comes as no surprise that they hailed from all over, many of them from the area which I now represent. The bravery of these Australians will not be forgotten. Australians like Arthur Henley, who was living in Burpengary when he enlisted on the 9th of October 1915. He enlisted as a private and embarked from Sydney on board the HMATSS Hawke's Bay on the 20th of April of 1916. Now, Arthur's fine service will not be forgotten. He was awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal for the most conspic conspicuous gallantry and determination that he displayed at Villaret in 1918. Now, this labourer from regional Queensland twice led his section at enemy strong points which were holding up the advance. He worked his gun to a flank and brought fire to bear on the strong point. Later, he led charge against an enemy machine gun, firing his gun from the hip. Now, Arthur succeeded in capturing it and with it, seven prisoners. And Australia was very lucky to see him return home on the 5th of September of 1919. But as we all know, not everyone was so lucky. Of the 400,000 Australians who served, more than 150,000 were wounded, gassed or taken prisoner. And tragically, 60,000 gave their lives to defend this great nation of ours. This, of course, took a truly significant toll on the individuals, their families and the communities that, of course, survived them. Deputy Speaker, 
in seeking to better understand my region's contribution to the First World War, I came across an article that appeared in the newspaper The Queenslander on, on August 4 of 1917. It reads, Charles Munro of Burpengary, Queensland, that's how it begins, has received a cablegram from the commandment, 13th Flying Squadron, advising that his son, Lieutenant J.D. Munro, was killed in England in an aeroplane accident on the 17th instant. The article continues to detail Lieutenant Munro's interesting and impressive record. He was one of the earliest volunteers to leave the state in 1914. He was at the nation-defining landing of Gallipoli, where he served for several months on that campaign. And when he found love while he enlisted, marrying a nurse who helped restore him to health following a bout of illness. Now, I know the tragedy that was his death will never be forgotten. Deputy Speaker, I also came across an article from the Brisbane Courier that ran on the 30th of August of 1918, and it read, news has been received by Mr and Mrs JC Callior, Mount Comrie, Upper Caboolture, that their second son, Private T H Callior, died of wounds on August 9 in France. This is their second son to make the supreme sacrifice. As a parent, I can feel myself connecting with these very personal stories. We so often retell the courageous stories of bravery and valour that personal stories can become lost. We often forget that while these brave men and women served overseas, they left behind their parents, their loved ones and their families. We forget that for regular Australian parents like those of Lieutenant Munro or Private Kellyer, while their children were serving overseas, life was just meant to just go on. Well, I know the pride they would have felt, but I also know how devastating it must have been to read that cablegram that relayed such tragic, tragic news for their family. Deputy Speaker, we will not forget them. We will not forget those who served and we will not forget the sacrifices that they made. A hundred years has passed since the guns fell silent on the Western Front. Even a hundred years from today, our nation is still in their debt. We will remember them lest we forget. I thank the member for Longman. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Calair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Communities around Australia gathered to attend services of the September the Armistice that finally ended the fighting of the First World War on Sunday the 11th of November. It was a conflict, Deputy Speaker, which changed our nation forever. From a population of under 5 million, 420,000 Australians enlisted, and over 61,000 paid the ultimate sacrifice. Over one single 24-hour period at Fromel, there were over 5,500 Australian casualties. Mothers and fathers lost sons, wives lost husbands, and children lost fathers. When the town bells rang out a century ago, there was no doubt joy and relief that the war was over. But there was also immense sorrow and grief. And the men and women who served and sacrificed for Australia only asked of future generations one thing, that we remember them. And at Remembrance Day services this year, communities across the electorate of Calair came out in large numbers to fulfil that sacred commitment. At Candos, 150 community members gathered at the Memorial Wall in Candos to commemorate the centenary of the Armistice, which was organised by uh, members of the RSL, including President uh, John Taylor, Vice President Glenn Evans, Secretary and Treasurer Ken Devitt, and along with World War II veterans Lance Ford and Val Wage. A special feature of this year's service was the 2,501 knitted and crocheted poppies and homemade Anzac biscuits made by local women in the community, including Jan Bailey, Pauline Brooks, Marilyn Comer, Joyce Dobble, Regina Dinton, Julie Denton, Lynette Edwards, Gwen English, Yukiko Evans, Rose Evans, Elizabeth Gardner, Joan George, Catherine Gleeson, Pat Glover, Chris Hassel, Val Herbert, Elaine Hegarty, Carol Hayward, Denise Jamieson, Marsha James, Judy James, Sharon Joyce, Jean Lloyd, Leonie McKenna, Sandra McIntosh, Carol Morrissey, Joe Ma, Joy Murray, Barbara Murray, Barbara Martin, Wendy Rodder, Ellen Riley, Joan Schultz, Mary Smith, Lynn Taylor, Mona Timpson, Doreen Worth, Bev Williams and Marjorie Windle. The poppies, which were made into banners and hung around the community hall, have since been donated to the Candos and Rylestone Museums. In addition to the poppies, 100 wire crosses were installed representing local servicemen, and these crosses were available for purchase with funds raised going to Soldier On. 
In Wellington, there were 200 uh, in attendance or even more at a service which featured performances by the Wellington Town Band and local a cappella group Stray Notes, led by Ro Ross Godfrey. I'd like to make mention of the hardworking Wellington RSL sub-branch members, including the President Roy Holmes, Secretary Peter Jarrett, Vice President Beryl Althoffer, Welfare Officer Rod Althoffer, Treasurer Peter Duffy, and also committee members Peter Dowell, Aaron Edwards, Mark Inwood, Leslie Langbean, Chris Wykes, Ray Klein, and Gary Francis. In Galgong, commemorations were held at Anzac Park, which features a new memorial, uh, which the members have just recently uh, installed. And Branch Pre Secretary John Fielding made a number of trips to the battlefield in France uh, and drew up the plans um, from photos he'd taken for the new uh, memorial, uh, which is a scale replica of the memorial in France where the armistice was signed. The new memorial is located on the eastern side of the rotunda and will be a focal point for future Remembrance Day commemorations. And uh, the Galgong RSL branch received a $3,000 uh, armistice centenary uh, grant to help uh, with the new memorial. And I note the members of the uh, Galgong RSL sub-branch all worked very hard for that service and for the unveiling of the memorial. And I'd like to mention President David Henderson, Treasurer Craig Holden, Senior Vice President Peter Liotta. And I also have to make mention of the late Junior Vice President and Galgong's last World War II veteran, Les Monks. And I attended the funeral of Les Monks in Galgong last week, and he will be greatly missed. There was also a very strong turnout at Oberon's commemorations, and Oberon RSL sub-branch President Bill Wilcox recited the ode, and he was ably supported in organising the commemorations by other RSL sub-branch members, including Secretary Neville Stapleton, Treasurer Don Stevens, and Trustee Elaine Boxer, and local Oberon High School student Peter McGrath gave a presentation following the service on her 12-day trip to the Western Front battlefields. And I would like to pay tribute to all RSL members and community groups who organised services for Remembrance Day this year and also thank all community members who attended a service and fulfilled that sacred commitment to remember. I thank the member for Kelly. I call the member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker. This Remembrance Day, we commemorated the centenary of Armistice Day, a day where we honour the spirit of our service personnel. We are reminded of their sacrifice, a sacrifice made on our behalf and one deserving of our nation's respect and gratitude. I'm very grateful to my team uh, who represented our office uh, right across the electorate. Uh, I attended a service in Langhorne Creek, uh, down the very bottom of my electorate. And uh, prior to attending the service, I drove a 1954 Massey Ferguson, raising money for legacy from Malang to Langhorne Creek, and that was quite a feat. This year also marked the 25 years since the unknown soldier was laid to rest at the Australian War Memorial on the 11th of November 1993. For those of you who have visited the memorial, you would have been struck by the words etched into the foot of the unknown soldier's tomb, he is all of them, he is one of us. Our veterans are not confined to the pages of well-worn textbook or some romantic notion captured on the silver screen. Our veterans are our grandparents, our parents, our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives. They are our past, our present, and indeed our future. If we look to the past, the statistics can be difficult to comprehend. For example, in the First World War alone, over 150,000 service personnel were wounded, gassed or taken prisoner, with 60,000 never to return home to their families. But it's not until we speak to our older Australians that we actually get a sense of the grief and loss that rippled through our communities after every conflict. And of the memories of our older Australians fade, the importance of Remembrance Day, I believe, grows. The Australian War Memorial plays a vital role in ensuring our young Australians understand the meaning of Remembrance Day and that we as a nation continue to honour and respect the sacrifices made by young men and women a hundred years ago and over the last 100 years. However, not every family can afford to make the long trip to Canberra, but the Virtual War Memorial is a South Australian RSL initiative that seeks to do just that. It brings to life the history of service personnel using technology to share their stories with the next generation. 
We know that for many of our servicemen and women, the challenges they face can often follow them home from deployment and into civilian life. South Australia, through Veterans SA, was a key driver in recognising transition from the military as a priority issue for ADF personnel and their families. Successful transition is a significant mitigating factor in avoiding the challenging post-service issues such as homelessness, incarceration, broken families, mental health and wellbeing issues. Looking after our veterans must be a priority. And with that, we, we, and with what we now know about mental health and post-traumatic stress, we must do better. The Jamie Larkham Centre in Adelaide adopts a model of care that offers inpatient and outpatient care and programs research and a partnership hub that helps veterans and their families to connect with ex-service organisations and community groups who provide to assist recovery from mental illness. In excess of 70,000 ADF personnel have, have been deployed on global operations since our involvement in Timor-Leste in 1999. We must position ourselves to be able to address the needs of these service personnel as they transition from ADF and look to new careers as they move into retirement. We can't allow them to fall into a chasm. Uh, we, we need to ensure that we treat our, our veterans properly and we provide them with a full complement of services for, that tr for a successful transition. I commend the Minister for Veterans Affairs on the work he has done so far as outlined in last month's veterans statement, but we must ensure that we learn from the mistakes of the past and that we treat our veterans and their families with the respect they so richly deserve. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was a great honour uh, to attend the service in Langhorne Creek. It was a very small service, but it was a very meaningful service. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the RSLs uh, right across my community for putting on a poignant and moving Remembrance Day services uh, right across the Mayo electorate. Thank you. I thank the a member for Mayo. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call a member for Fisher. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Every year on the 11th of November, we rightly commemorate the armistice which ended the First World War. As a centenary commemoration of that day, this 11th of November, however, was particularly special. In Mullaney, in my electorate of Fisher, our community created a unique and vibrant commemoration to reflect the importance of the day. On the 30th of November, 1918, just two weeks after the end of the Great War, Mullaney's families, still awaiting the return of their servicemen overseas, organised a parade to celebrate the armistice. Looking at the photographs shared by the RSL, you can tell that the Mullaney Victory Parade was undoubtedly a colourful affair. It brought together publicans, police constables, servicemen and schoolchildren, uniting ordinary men and women from every part of our community. The vision of our own Chris Brooker and the Mullaney RSL in 2018 uh, was to recreate that peace march, this Armistice Day, and honour the memory not only of those who served, but of the families left behind. 80 students from Mullaney and Conondale schools and their teachers took part in vintage dress, while Mullaney Men's Shed and TS Centaur recreated the naval-themed float Sydney. Members of the Mullaney Hospital Auxiliary dressed in vintage Australian Red Cross nurses' costumes to remember the vital role that many women played during the war. Just as in the first parade, the Indian Australian community came out to display the Indian national flag and remember the, the contribution of our Commonwealth allies, as did our Canadian uh, 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 expats as well. Community groups from every part of Mullaney took part, including the Mullaney Singers, Mullaney Players, Mullaney Equestrian Group, the Mullaney Bush Rangers and the Blackhall Range Horseless Carriage Group, as did our, our Light Horse Brigade. The RSL meticulously <laughs> followed the run sheet of the original parade. They even ensured that members of some of the same families were represented, like Bill Hankinson, who followed in his father's footsteps riding in the parade as John Bull. Around a 1,000 people attended and a great day was had by all. Hundreds lined the route to see the many horse-drawn carts and carriages, the period costumes, vintage cars and push bikes, 
the flags, the cattle and more. I was proud to take part in my own period costume to play a role in recreating our community's history and follow in the footsteps of the Sunshine Coast's pioneers. I want to thank all those who dressed up, polished, polished their vintage cars and got their horses and carts out of the barns. You all made a splendid sight and, and a moving commemoration of the events of 1918. Most of all, I want to thank Chris Brooker uh, for organising such a unique and evocative Armistice, Armistice Day event. You did our community proud, Chris, and we are all very rightly proud for, of your efforts. In recent weeks, I was also privileged to dedicate three new memorials to the centenary of the First World War Armistice, supported by this government's Armistice Centenary Grants Program. I visited TS Onslow, the Royal Australian Navy Cadets Unit in Golden Beach, to, to dedicate a commemorative mural wall. In Mullaney, I visited another of our active and dedicated Australian Navy Cadet units at TS Centaur to dedicate their new centenary commemoration flagpole. This flagpole is going to allow the cadets from now on to fly the Australian national flag during their weekly colours ceremony. Finally, on Armistice Day itself, I visited 223 Squadron Australian Air Force cadets where before the main ceremony got underway, I had the opportunity to speak to the young cadets and to dedicate a new commemoration stone. In total, across Fisher, five organisations took advantage of the, uh, of the Armistice Centenary Grant Program. These included, in addition to those I've mentioned, the Caloundra RSL sub-branch, who extended and refurbished their wonderful memorial garden, and the Malulabar State School, who constructed a new community memorial garden. I'm grateful to the organisations concerned for their commitment to the important task of remembrance and to the Minister for Veterans Affairs for his support in helping uh, these new memorials across my community to become a reality, lest we forget. Lest we forget. And I thank the member for Fisher. And there being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. And now we move to the adjournment and I call the member for New England. Um, Mr Speaker, I move that the Federation Chamber do now adjourn. I thank the member, the I member for Corwell. I thank the member for Corwell. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it and the Federation Chamber stands adjourned until 4pm tomorrow.